Today, there are three Scandinavian nations, which are also kingdoms, Denmark, Sweden and Norway. The people of these three nations speak languages that are so similar to each other that they can understand each other perfectly. This is because they all descend from a common language, the Old Norse, or Norrenamål. Old Norse was the language spoken in this region a thousand years ago during the Viking Age. A somewhat modernized form of the original Norse language is still spoken in countries that were settled by Norsemen, mostly from Norway, during the 8 to 10 centuries, such as Iceland and the Faroe Islands. The Old Norse descends from Old Nordic, which was a North Germanic dialect related to West Germanic and East Germanic, such as Old English and Old High German dialects. These branches developed during the Scandinavian Iron Age, when many of the Scandinavian tribes migrated southwards. Up until 15,000 years ago, Scandinavia and most of northern Eurasia, that would be Europe and Asia, which together forms a continent, was covered by an enormous glacier, which had been there for a hundred thousand years. Fifty thousand years ago, the first Homo sapiens humans settled in Europe, where only Neanderthals had lived before. From Iberia in the west to Siberia in the east, hunter-gatherer Ice Age cultures of the tundras and the plains and the forests shared a lifestyle and experienced the same climate and appear to have known a shamanistic, animistic sort of religious life. 16,000 years ago, the old glacier had receded significantly and left a piece of land that later sunk into the rising sea. We call this land Doggeland, and it was a part of the European continent as well as a broad land bridge between Ireland, England and France, the Netherlands and Denmark. People who were descendants of the first Ice Age cave painting cultures of southwestern Europe, that would be roughly Portugal, Spain and France, began moving north into Doggeland, in the area that would later become Ireland and England and the North Sea. Descendants of these early Iberians slowly, over the generations, migrated in every possible direction. Many of them went into Doggeland. Some of their descendants moved into the previously uninhabited area of what we today call Denmark and North Germany, and from there into the region we today call Sweden. We know this both from archaeological finds and from more recent DNA studies of ancient skeletons, showing that the first Scandinavians carried the same MT DNA as the first cave painters of southwestern Europe. Other migration routes, roughly around 10,000 years ago, went into Scandinavia from Siberia, Eastern Europe and West Central Asia, the Caucasus area, through Finland into Northern Norway, from, from there along the coast into what is today Norway. We know this too from DNA studies and archaeology. For the first couple of thousand years after the Ice Age, the people who inhabited Denmark and Sweden were distant descendants of the Iberian cave painters, while the people who inhabited the coast of Norway and Finland were descendants of the Ice Age tundra tribes from the East and the Black Sea area. Over the next few thousand years, they all blended together and developed lighter skin tones. 8,000 to 6,000 years ago, ancient Neolithic village cultures developed into large civilizations in Africa, that would be around Egypt, Ethiopia, Kush, Nubia and Sudan, 
and the Middle East, Iraq, Syria, Canaan, Anatolia, and Asia, like India and China. While these first large civilizations that we know of existed and flourished, nomadic pastoral warrior tribes emerged to the north, Mongol tribes to the far east, Turkic tribes in Central Asia, and Yamna Kurgans, that would be the Indo-Europeans in West Central Asia. Southeastern Europe flourished as a Stone Age Neolithic village culture, some have called Old Europe, um, and further to the west and north, most people were still hunter-gatherers, including Scandinavians and Brits. While the southern civilizations flourished and began using bronze, northern Europe was settled by hunter-gatherers, but southern Europe was settled by farmers. These farmers of old Europe were, some 6,000 years ago, invaded by migrants from the east. These migrants have been called Kurgans or Yamna by modern archaeologists, and they brought with them the Indo-European language family. The first Indo-European tribes that developed after they began expanding and conquering territories on the Eurasian continent were the Thracians, the Mycenaeans, the Hittites, the Iranians and the Vedic Aryans in India. They were pastoral, Stone Age nomads who were quite primitive compared to the villagers and townspeople that they met, but they were very warlike and successful in conquering the more peaceful farmer cultures that they encountered. They married the native women and adapted to their more civilized lives, learning their art of writing and complex infrastructure. Their main contribution was their language, which came to dominate everywhere. They also brought genetic markers for tallness, and it seems that they also uh, had a very strong type of mythology that is recognizable from Scandinavia in the north to England in the west and to India in the east. Just as the Yamna or Kurgans invaded southeastern Europe, Scandinavia and the British Isles experienced a third major migration wave. It is likely that it was the invasion of the Kurgans or Yamna which caused this migration, as people from southern Europe began to flee north. Scandinavians carrying mtDNA haplogroup H for Helena are direct descendants through the motherline of the people who came from the area we today call Greece and the surrounding lands 6,000 years ago, fleeing the aggressive conquerors. These were the people who brought agriculture to the north, people from old Europe. In Scandinavia and other parts of northwestern Europe, these farmers met only hunter-gatherers and for many generations, farmers and hunters lived side by side until they had blended together and agriculture had become more common than not, at least in the southern parts of Scandinavia. Further north, people were still hunter-gatherers. Some of these hunter-gatherers would survive as the Sami population until the present day. Around 6,000 years ago, while the first farmers from the south and the east settled in northwestern Europe, and the first Indo-Europeans settled in the southeast of Europe, the large civilizations of the southern lands entered the Bronze Age, the art of making bronze slowly spreading east and west and south. But it would take another 2,000 years before bronze reached Scandinavia. Between 6,000 and 4,000 years ago, the merging between southern farmers and northern hunter-gatherers had also brought a very special culture, the Atlantean megalithic. Megaliths had been built in other more southern areas before, but now the art spread to the European Atlantic coast as far north as southern Scandinavia. This was the Sto Stone Age civilization of Western Europe, while the Bronze Age emerged to the southeast. Between 5,000 and 4,500 years ago, a fourth and the last major migration wave into Scandinavia happened again. 
this time from the Black Sea and the Caucasus area. Again, the Indo-European speaking Yamna and Kurgan population that had earlier expanded into southeastern Europe, Anatolia and Asia, now expanded to the north of Europe and then westwards, bringing their language and their myths and social structures, changing the face of Europe forever. While Bronze Age civilizations flourished around the Mediterranean Ocean and Asia, the blending of older populations of the North and the Indo-European newcomers resulted in a late Neolithic Stone Age culture we know as the Corded Ware culture, stretching from Volga in the east in Russia to the Rhine in the west, including the southern parts of Scandinavia. After about 500 years, the Corded Ware culture was split into several smaller Indo-European speaking cultures. From southern Scandinavia, Corded Ware culture people spread into other parts of northwestern Europe and developed into a culture known among other things as the Battle Axe culture. This was probably the area era when different Indo-European languages emerged in Northern Europe, Slavic, Balto-Slavic, Celtic, Italic and Germanic. They were the results of the merging between an original Indo-European language and older local native languages. Around 1800 before Christ, almost 4000 years ago, the first bronze was finally introduced into southern Scandinavia through trading with the Mediterranean world, causing the emergence of a culture known to archaeologists as the Nordic Bronze Age, which included a part of southwestern Finland. The Nordic Bronze Age was an era of intense traveling, trading and interaction between Scandinavia and the Mediterranean cultures such as Egypt, Crete, Greece, Mesopotamia, as well as Thrace, Anatolia and the Celtic worlds. The oldest written source that may be describing Scandinavians dates to about 450 before Christ when the Greek historian Herodot told of an event that had happened a few centuries earlier during the transition from the Nordic Bronze Age into the Celtic Iron Age. Two so-called Hyperborean priestesses travelled from their land behind the North Wind carrying sacred objects, accompanied by five warriors, until they reached the Greek island of Delos where they stayed, treated as holy women after delivering the mysterious holy objects to the temple of Artemis, the goddess of hunting and childbirth. This pilgrimage was, according to Herodot, an ancient tradition which had happened several times before, testifying to the ancient Bronze Age connection between the North and the Mediterranean that is also evident in the archaeological material. Around 600 before Christ, when the Hellenic culture began to wield great influence in the southern part of the world, the Celtic tribes were among the first in northwest to central Europe to import a new trade, iron. As the first Iron Age culture in central Europe, the Celts became a dominant force and they isolated the north from the south for several centuries, forming a border between them but they also introduced the Iron Age to Scandinavia. The Scandinavian Iron Age began about 600 to 500 before Christ and lasted until around 950 to 1050 AD when the Scandinavian countries gradually became part of the medieval culture of Western Europe and converted from paganism to Christianity. The Scandinavian Iron Age may be divided roughly into four periods. The first is the Celtic Iron Age, which lasted from around 600 to 100 before Christ. 
The second stage is the Roman Iron Age, also called the Migration Age, which lasted from 100 before Christ until about 500 AD. The Merovingian and Germanic Iron Age is the third stage and it lasted only for around 250 years between 500 and 750 AD. It was followed by the early Viking Age, the fourth stage, which lasted from around 750 and until 950 AD. The latter part of the Viking Age can no longer be counted as an Iron Age culture since the intense interaction with Christian medieval Europe gradually led to Scandinavia's, Scandinavia's entry into this new cultural era and its new religion. The term Celtic Iron Age has been applied to this era because of the powerful Celtic cultural influence and dominance in Northwestern and Central Europe during this period. Celtic art and craftworks evidently influenced Scandinavian cultures to a great extent, just as it influenced other cultures in these parts of Europe. The powerful Celtic tribes formed a border between the Greek Roman empires and the people who lived further north. Scandinavians, who had been trading with the Mediterranean for thousands of years before and during the Nordic Bronze Age, now lived in relative isolation from the civilized world to the south and traded mostly with Celtic people, Slavs and Finns. However, the age of Celtic dominance came to an end when tribal differences among them made them relatively easy prey to the expanding Roman Empire. The Roman Iron Age, also called the Migration Age, lasted from 100 before Christ until about 500 AD. This time period is called the Roman Iron Age because of the formidable power and cultural influence of the Roman Empire, which came to include the entire Mediterranean Ocean, including North Africa, the Middle East, South, South Europe, as well as part of the British Isles and Gaul, which is roughly the area of France today. Roman culture held powerful influence also among the Germanic tribes and on Scandinavian culture during this era. Scandinavians traded with and imported goods from all over the empire and sent their best warriors to fight in Roman armies. The Roman Iron Age marks the first contact between Scandinavians and the Roman Empire after 500 years of isolation, when the Celts no longer blocked the routes of Central Europe. Three tribes who said they came from Jutland in southern Denmark, fleeing the devastations after a large flood, flood were the Cimbri, the Teutons and the Ambronis. These migrated southwards during the first century before Christ and waged war against the Romans. A formidable enemy, these Scandinavians were defeated eventually but were forever remembered by the Romans for their ferocity in battle and for the courage and warlike honour of their women, who followed the armies and watched the battles from the sidelines, shouting words of encouragement to the men. When the Teutons were defeated and the men slayed, the Teuton women asked if they could live out their lives as temple priestesses in service to Roman goddesses, but were told that they faced slavery and rape instead. Shocked, the women held council, and by the end of the council they had all committed collective suicide rather than be taken as slaves. The Romans were deeply impressed by these women. These Scandinavian tribes also brought with them large groups of sacrificial priestesses, elderly, white-clad women with long loose hair who would mercilessly sacrifice the Roman prisoners and let their blood run out into large iron cauldrons while they beat their large wicker drums with human femur bones. In the blood of their victims, these priestesses could read the future and prophesy further victories. From other accounts of Germanic tribes, 
we know that it was common for the warlords to be accompanied by a group of women who were thought to be able to divine the future. The Romans referred to these women as matrona, which means mothers. The Roman Iron Age was the era when many Scandinavian tribes migrated south into Central Europe, where they roamed around and became known to the Romans as Germans, a common Latin nomer for all the different tribes. They did not call themselves Germans, however, but, uh, but now knew themselves by the names of their particular tribes. Some of the most famous tribes who migrated around the continent were the Goths, the Langobards, the Teutons and the Franks. This is partly why this time period has become known as the Migration Age. This is also roughly when the Nordic language divided into North, West and East Germanic dialects. The Northern part developed into Old Norse, the Western into Old English and the Eastern into Old High German tribal dialects. Contact between Scandinavia migrated migrating Germanic tribes and the Roman Empire lasted for 600 years and took many forms. There were wars, and while the Germans tended to just sacrifice captured Roman soldiers, thousands of captured Germans, women and children especially, were taken into slavery in the Mediterranean world. But there was also friendly interaction, trading and diplomacy. The Romans wrote about the various tribes with fascination, even respect. Although there were obviously barbaric and fierce aspects to these people, the Romans also observed among the various tribes the ancient tradition of collective ruling by democratic parliament, an unusual degree of respect for women, and a relative lack of material greed. For the duration of almost 600 years, barbarian tribes such as the Germanic ones and the Huns moved crisscross around Europe. One of the Germanic tribes, the Vandals, even ventured into North Africa, and some remained there. The Ostrogoths got as far east as to Anatolia, where they posed a threat to Constantinople itself. Towards the end of the Roman Iron Age, during the time period between 350 and 453, a new people entered Central Europe from the east, the Huns. Conquering several Slavic and Germanic tribes in East Central Europe and posing a serious threat to the Western Germanic tribes of the continent, they caused another bout of intense migration as the tribes fled the seemingly invincible people from the east. The Goths, impressed, believed that the Huns were the result of a vengeance from their ancient priestesses, the Haliorunna. Um, they had been, that means the Hel Helruns, they had been expelled from their tribes once the Goths had emigrated from Gotland in Sweden into the European continent. The priestesses had travelled east and mated with demons there, creating the Hunnish nation. The impact of the Huns was severe, both culturally and historically. Attila the Hun still plays a major role in Edda legendary poetry written down in Old Norse on Iceland 700 years later testifying to the intense interaction between the Huns and the German tribes, both of a friendly and warlike nature. In 453 AD, Attila the Hun died, and a rumour had it that the Germanic princess had killed him as revenge for her father and brothers. The Huns denied this, but in the poetic Edda, the Bergen princess Gudrun is credited with this act. Attila's death caused such disruption that the entire Hunnish Empire crumbled within a few years and the tribes were finally free from their conquests. In the poetic Edda, Gudrun is celebrated as the last warrior woman. Less than a century later, in 536 AD, a great volcanic eruption led to a three-year-long winter in Northern Europe. 
perhaps the one remembered in Norse myths as Fimbulvetr, the great winter. Ashes clouded the sky, and the sun goddess could not be seen. Fields would not grow, and famine and plague abounded. This was also the century when the West Roman Empire began to crumble, and civilization as they knew it gradually disappeared, leading to a time period of very few written sources and the loss of information and infrastructure. This is why the following era, 500 to 800, has been called the Dark Ages. During the Dark Ages, the new religion of the late Roman Empire, Christianity, took hold and the Catholic Church came to dominate most of Western Europe. While the other descendants of Germanic tribes on the European continent and the British Isles became part of a Christian medieval culture, the people of Scandinavia remained pagan and isolated from the surrounding world, continuing their Iron Age lifestyle and their Iron Age religion. This period of the Scandinavian Iron Age has been called the Merovingian, or else the Germanic Iron Age, due to their cultural isolation from other influences at this time. During this isolated era, Scandinavia was divided into many different tribes, of which some were kingdoms and other republics. It was an already ancient custom of the tribes to be self-ruled through democratic parliament, which in most of the tribes even had the power to elect kings and sacrifice kings if they failed to please the people. The parliaments were sacred, and their myths reveal that even the gods ruled the world through common council, held by the well of the Norns, who were the goddesses of fate. The king had to be a royal lineage, but had to prove himself before the parliament, and was inaugurated through a ritual of sacred marriage to the goddess or ancestral mother of the land, who represented the fate of the people. One of the oldest large Merovingian kingdoms of Scandinavia that we know of was Hålogalan. Other important and powerful lands were Svitjod, Gautland, Jutland, Zealand, Scania, Rogaland, Hordaland, Gotland. There were many, many, many tribes, and they were each like a separate country. During the Merovingian, many of the tribal lands that have survived in the names of modern Scandinavian counties already existed. Back then, each of these regions were nations of their own, ruled independently through tribal council and led by tribal kings or chiefs. On this map you may see some of the most important tribal lands of southern Scandinavia. These names still exist as the names of counties. Before the Merovingian era, what we now call Denmark was inhabited by several different tribes. Around 400, the most important tribes of Jutland were the Anglos and the Saxons. Zealand, however, was ruled by the royal house of the Sholunga dynasty from their seat at Leire, ruling the tribe of the Danes, who also lived in Scania, which is today in southern Sweden. Just towards the end of the Roman Iron Age, when the Romans no longer held sway in the British Isles, the tribe of the Danes expanded their territory from Scania and Zealand into Jutland, forcing the tribes of the Anglos and Saxons to flee. Some of them fled to the British Isles, where they blended with the Celta Roman population and became so influential culturally that their language came to dominate. Others fled south into what became Saxon in northern Germany. By 500 AD, Jutland had become a part of the Danish nation. It had three power centers, one in North Jutland, 
where the town of Ribe was to emerge as a center of power. Another in South Jutland, where the town of Hedeby was to become a center of power. A third was in Zealand, where the Sjollunga lineage ruled from their center at Lyra. The Sjollungar believed that they were descended from Sjoll, a son of Odin and Gefjun Freya. It is possible that all the three centers of power were connected through a common king at some times, else divided into three different kingdoms at other times. By the end of the Merovingian age, however, we know that all of Denmark was finally ruled by one king. The Great Hall of Leire in Seelen was described already in the Old English epic poem Beowulf, the story of which probably dates back to the early 400s and then ruled by the Sjollunga clan, descendants of Odin and Gefjun Freya. In the story, the royal house is haunted by a terrible demon, Grendel, and gets help from Beowulf from Gautland in what we today call Sweden. The power of the Sjollungar faded after a scandal involving incest between father and daughter, and they were reduced to being kings of Scania alone. Denmark was once more divided into smaller regions, all fighting for power until the last Sjollung returned to Denmark from Scania around the year 700. His name was Eva Rules Widely, and his daughter Aud gave birth to a new dynasty which was to rule both in Denmark and Sweden. During the Roman Iron Age and the following Merovingian period, there were also many different tribal lands in what we now call Sweden. The two most powerful Swedish tribes were the Svear from Svithjord and the Gauts from Gautland, but there were many others too. The Gauts and the Geats of Gautland and Gotland were ancestral to the Goths who had long roamed the European continent, but many of them had remained. The Svear were the ones to finally give name to the Swedish nation. Their centre of power was in Uppsala, close to Stockholm. It was a religious centre of pilgrimage from all over Scandinavia since time immemorial. Uppsala was a great and important religious centre throughout all of Scandinavia, as well as a centre of power for the kings of the Svear tribe, the Ynglingar. They believed that they were descended from the god Freyr and his wife Gerd. By the year 900, a Norwegian skald presented a lineology to the last yngling, Ragnvald Heidumheri, counting his lineage back for 30 generations. Which would, if it was accurate, take us back to at least the first century before Christ, to the beginning of the Roman Iron Age. We do not know if the lineology is historically correct, but we do know that the people of the 9th and 10th century believed in it. According to this Ynglingatal, the kingdom of the Svear knew of great unrest and trouble during the 6th and 7th century, especially towards the latter end of the Merovingian time period. The last good Ynglinga king of Svitjod was Arnun the road builder, who may have lived roughly between 540 and 610. He was credited with building roads throughout the thickly forested land of the Svear, thus attempting to create a more civilized and organized infrastructure in the country. He was probably inspired by the Roman roads. His son, however, became known as Ingjal the Bad Ruler. Ingjal married a princess from Gautland and became king of the Svear. But this was not enough. Ingjal wanted to create an empire by subduing all the other Swedish tribes. In a terrible incident, Ingjal the Bad Ruler invited six other Swedish kings from six other tribes to come and sit together to rule as equals from a new hall that he had built, the Hall of the Seven Kings. Five of the invited kings turned up, and as soon as they had sat down in their high seats, 
surrounded by their most important men. Inge locked the hall and set it to fire. Among them was his own father-in-law, the king of West Gautland. In just one night, Ingjall had conquered five other tribes by treason and deceit. Ingjall sent his daughter Osa to marry the Sjollunga king of Skania, but he had a treacherous plan. Osa was to make sure that her husband and his brother killed each other so that she may usurp the throne of Skania on her father's behalf. Incidentally, Osa was also called the bad ruler, like her father. Only one of the invited kings, Granmar, king of Södermansland, had sensed the betrayal to come and escaped into Gautland, which was still free. In his desperation, he invited a sea king that would be a leader of a large fleet of Vikings. He invited these Vikings to his home and offered to marry his daughter off to the sea king. This was previously unheard of. Yes, Vikings already existed, as in pirates, even if they still kept to more homely territories. They had been harassing the people of the Scandinavian coastlines for a long time, forcing them to become warriors of the ocean steeds in order to protect themselves. Now, a king from the mainland invited these hated and despised Vikings to his home and he married off uh, his daughter Hildegun to the Viking chief. And with his new Viking army, Granmar allied himself with the East Gauts who were still free from Sveadur. For decades this alliance managed to stay free from Ingjall's plan to rule them all. Osa, the bad ruler, managed to cause the death of her Scanian husband and his brother. Uh, they were both they both killed each other, but they, she had not counted on her husband's nephew Ivar, who was now the last Sholung. Eva chased Osa back to her father in Uppsala, and then he allied himself with all the tribes that had become vassals to Ingjall and the Svear. Soon enough, both Ingjall and his daughter Osa had to flee. They fled Uppsala, Uppsala and they finally committed suicide by setting fire to the hall that they were hiding in, rather than being captured. But Ynglinga lineage was not dead even as they finally, after 20 generations, lost the high seat of Uppsala to the Scanian Sholung Ivar. Ingjall's son Olaf survived, a prince of peaceful disposition quite unlike his father and sister. With a following of devoted Svear, he fled into the forests of Värmland. Ivar of Scania had, however, no intention of returning autonomy to the tribes who had helped him. He now assumed the throne at Uppsala and the new tribal empire, Sveariki, which is roughly Sweden. And he also conquered the Danish nation. He was the first king to rule all the tribes of both Sweden and Denmark. His name was Ivar Rules Widely, and he was the last Sholung. To Ivar's realm was counted the ancient tribal realms of Svitjord, Gautland and smaller Swedish kingdoms, Gotland, Burgunderholm, Scania, Sealand, Jutland and the other Danish islands. If any of this is historically true, as we only have legends to build on, Ivar was the first Scandinavian king to rule this many tribes that made up what we today regard as Denmark and most of Sweden. His rule would have happened sometime around 690 and 730. Eva rules widely, had no sons, no male heirs to his lineage. The Sholunga dynasty, as it reached another peak of power, was dying out since it followed the father line. But Eva had a very resourceful and intelligent daughter, Aud the Deep-Minded, a born politician. As the female end of the Sholunga lineage descended from the gods, she could start a new dynasty. Eva married Audof to one of the many royally descended Danish suitors 
Rurik the Ringslinger. With him, she had a famous son, Harald Wartooth. But as Harald Wartooth grew and her father Ivar died, Aud the Deep-Minded realized that her husband, Rurik the Ringslinger, was planning treason against her and their son Harald, planning to place another heir by another wife on the throne of the Danish-Swedish Empire. Aud, very much her father's daughter, travelled east into Gardariki, which was what they called Russia back then, and found a great pirate fleet, ruled by a famous sea king, Rodbar the Viking. As the potential mother to a new royal dynasty, Aud promised herself to Rodbard and to any son to come, uh, she promised them the throne of Denmark, if he would only help her overthrow her husband Rurik. Rodbard agreed. This was before the Viking Age, and Vikings were still just rogue pirates who were loaded as bandits and lawless men by other Scandinavians. They had harassed their own home shores for centuries, gradually been forced to move eastwards to the Finnish and Baltic shores, now slowly setting it, settling in the area of the Aldega Lake, which is uh, Ladoga in Russia. There they lived in large fleets, ruled by so-called sea kings. Now, Rodbard had a chance to gain a better reputation and a son who would be heir to the Danish throne. With his new wife, Aud the Deep-Minded, and her son, Harald Wartooth, Rodbard and his Viking fleet sailed west to Denmark and overthrew Rurik the Ringslinger. Now, Harald Wartooth was the new king of Sweden and Denmark together. Rodbard and Aud the Deep-Minded had a son together, and his son, again, was called Sigurd Ring. When Harald Wartooth was getting very old, he decided to honour his mother's promise to Rodbard and told his nephew Sigurd that he would become king of half the realm if he would only let Harald die in battle. Harald, you see, was a bit sad that he had reached old age, since he was devoted to Odin and wished to die in battle. Together, uncle and nephew staged a mock battle, which was real, of volunteers, both men and shield maidens who wished to prove their worth and reach glory in death by participating. At the Battle of Bråveler, which may have happened in the year 750, King Harald Wartooth and his, had his desired end. After the Battle of Bråveler, the empire of Ivar rules widely, Aud the Deep-Minded and Harald Wartooth was finally divided in two. His nephew, Sigurd Ring, became king of Denmark. One of his other sons or grandsons, uh, whose name we don't know, became king of Sweden. Denmark consisted of Jutland, Zeeland and the Isles, Scania and West Götaland. During the reign of Sigurd Ring, some of the southeast Norwegian realms also came beneath the sway of the Danish realm, including Vestfold and what came to be known as Ringerike, Ring's realm. Sweden consisted of Svitjord, East Götaland, Gotland, Bornholm and some eastern territories. What happened to the last Yngling? Olaf, son of Ingjald the Bad Ruler. He fled west into the thick forest of Vermland with his following of devoted Svear, who believed he was descended from Freyr and thus holy. He became known as Olaf the Treefeller, since he built land in the forest. But after a three years drought and famine, the Svear held parliament and decided that the land did not favour Olaf anymore and so they sacrificed him to Odin. After Olaf the Tree Feller was sacrificed, the Svear elected his son Halfdan Whitebone as his heir. Where the Ynglingar had been hereditary kings of Svitjod, they now had to adhere to an ancient custom still practiced by the Norwegian tribes. They had to earn kingship through marriages with the princesses of the Norwegian tribes. Halfdan married a Norwegian princess, Solvay from Solur, 
and eventually had power over the over the power of the kings of Oppland, Heidmark, Hadeland and Toten, and finally even conquered Westfall. His son, Einstein, inherited Oppland and Heidmark because of his marriage to Åsa of Oppland and Heidmark. His son, Halfdan the Generous and Foodstingy, married Hild of Westfall, and since Hild had no brothers, their son inherited Westfall, which became a new Ynglinga stronghold. All over Scandinavia, new and old trading ports grew into larger towns, and an international town culture emerged. The early Viking Age began with a new settlement in the east. Pirates, Vikings, mostly from the Swedish area, settled and built a town by the Ladoga Lake and the Volkov River, which they called Aldeigeborg, an important port of entry into the east. Aldeigeborg was settled around 752. Within a century, these descendants of Scandinavians had blended with native populations and expanded further into Russia and reached the river Volga. They were called Varingar, those who stay put. We know them as Varangians. Varangians. The natives and the Arabs with whom they traded called them Rus. Scandinavian rulers were deeply concerned by events taking place to the south of their realms. A new Frankish king, Charlemagne, was waging wars on the Saxons who lived by the Danish border in Jutland. The Saxons were closely related to the Danes, even if their ancestors had been forced to flee from them, they shared history, culture and religion. Now, Saxon refugees entered Denmark in great numbers, telling stories of sacrilege against their temples, the destruction of their parliaments, and forced mass baptism and massacres. Now, all should obey the decrees of Charles Magne, who had introduced a totalitarian regime. Not used to such totalitarian government, bereft of their religion and their own land, made into serfs to the Franks, the Saxon refugees made a deep impact on the Danes and other Norsemen. The new Christian laws of the continent also barred the ancient trade routes that Scandinavians had come to depend upon. The Christians no longer wanted to trade with pagans who had to move through their reins at sea if they wanted to reach the Arabs further south who still wanted to trade with pagans. And Norsemen really, really needed to trade with the outside world. That was how they had lived for several thousand years. It is now believed that concerns like these are the reason why Norsemen became Vikings in the first place and why they began by targeting Christian sanctuaries. The Danish king Sigurd Ring had ruled peacefully for some 50 years since the Battle of Bråveller in 750. He wished to keep peaceful relations with his neighbours and try to negotiate with both the Saxons and the Franks. He is the first Danish king to be recorded in the Frankish history chronicles, which were written down annually in parts, each part written down less than a year after they happened and as such a very valuable historical source. Here, Sigurding is called Sigifred, and it is said that he entertained both Widukin, the leader of the Saxon resistance, and Charlemagne at his court. It was only after Sigurd's death around 800 that the Viking Age attacks on England and Frankland began for real. Sigurd's descendants were Gudrod, Gudufrid and Ragnar Lodbrok. Sigurd Ring's descendant Gudröd is also mentioned in the Frankish annals, now called Godofrid. So he was a historical character. He was among the sons or descendants or of Sigurd who wanted to wage war against the Franks, whom they deemed a threat after seeing how they had crushed the neighboring Saxons and their entire pagan culture. Godofrid, who was Earl of Jutland, launched a first attack on the Franks with a large Danish fleet in 811, 
but the attack was stalled when Godofrid was suddenly murdered by an insignificant servant. According to the Ynglinga saga, however, Godofrid was called Gudrud, and he was not the son of Sigurin, but an Yngling, son of Halfdan the Generous of Westfall, and probably just related to Sigurin through the latter's dominance in Westfall. In the saga, Gudrud attacked the kingdom of Agdir, killed the king there, Harald Redbeard and his son Gud, and forcefully married the Agdir princess Osa Harald's daughter. Osa gave birth to a black-haired son called Halfdan the Black, but only a year after she had her devoted servant murder Gudrud in an act of vengeance. Osa returned to Agdir with her son and left Westfall over to Gudrud's other son, Olaf Geistad Elf. When Halfdan the Black, born in 810, and we know this because of the uh, Royal Frankish Annals, when, when Halfdan the Black came of an age, his half-brother, Olaf Geistad Elf, shared with him the kingdom of Westfall. Halfdan the Black was already king of Agdir after his mother Osa had ruled there until his adulthood. He fought with the king of Alfheim, who was actually called Gandalf, and his sons, and acquired several Norwegian tribal realms during his lifetime. Halfdan's son was Harald Luva, which means filter hair. He's the one who is better known as Harald Hairfair, which is a later polishing of his nickname. He was urged by a certain Gida, which means priestess, to become king of all Norway. Harald set out to conquer the other Norwegian tribes, inserting himself as a totalitarian central royal power. In order to rule all the 30 tribes, he had to marry a princess from each tribe, which is why he had 30 wives. One of the wives was actually from the Sami population, which indicates that the Sami tribe was a part of the, the 30 tribes of Norway. As a result of Harald's ambitions, Harald's ambitions, most of the former tribal kings and noblemen fled to the newly discovered Iceland. It is estimated that as much as one-fifth of the Norwegian population emigrated to Iceland, where they created a democratic republic without any kings at all. Around the year 900, the royal hall of Borg in Lofoten, where the kings of Hålogaland had dwelled since around 400, was abandoned. It is thought that the last king of this North Norwegian kingdom was Olaf Tvennumbruni, who fled the tyranny of Harald Luva and went to Iceland. Hålogaland became one of the many counties in the new nation. The same was the case with the other Norwegian kingdoms, such as Rogaland. It is believed that the last king of Rogaland was Geirmund Heljarsin, which means dark hide, the so-called black viking, whose mother was a dark-skinned Siberian. Geirmund, who like his father married a Siberian woman, was also among the previous Norwegian kings who left for Iceland, along with one-fifth of the Norwegian population who could not accept the central rule of a single king. In Iceland, most of the sagas and other literary material of Norway and Scandinavia were finally written down. Because of Icelanders, we have a wealth of stories, of sagas, of legends, of family histories, of lineologies and myths and poetry from the Viking Age and before. As much as one-fifth of the Norwegian population left for Iceland between 872 and 950. Iceland became an autonomous nation ruled by the old parliament and also a cradle for Norse literature collecting the sagas and poems of their ancestors. Norway was now a kingdom in its own right and Harald's sons and descendants would be contending for the throne and struggling with the power of the ancient tribal democratic parliaments for more than a century before the nation was finally consolidated beneath one king and one religion and one god. 
Denmark, Sweden and Iceland were also christened during the 11th and 12th centuries. Even if still in the Viking Age, the gradual conversion to Christianity and the emergence of three distinct Norse-speaking kingdoms and one republic marked Scandinavia's emergence from a pagan Iron Age culture into the Western European medieval civilization.